You may be seated. Well, as I said before, we just got back from uh, Michigan, and uh, uh, my wife and three daughters will be coming back uh, tonight. And then uh, Jamie goes off to college uh, in Minneapolis, uh, Bethel, uh, Thursday morning, and Cam goes off the same day to University of Montana. Uh, and uh, then it'll be just the three of us, Troy, Erica, and me. How about that? Quietest house we've had in a long time. Most Christians agree that the main way God speaks to us is through the Bible. For many, however, the Bible seems to be a mystery, uh, almost impossible to understand. How many of you have read the Bible at some point and you you got done reading it and you thought, wow, I, I I don't understand what that says? Raise your hand. So most of you. It doesn't have to be that way. Many people read the Bible as if It was mainly about us, our growth, our faith, our holiness, our godliness. But to read the Bible that way is to possibly miss the main point. Uh, In fact, unless we go to the Bible to see Jesus and his deliverance for us, the Bible can become nothing more than a chore in our self-improvement plans. God's goal in speaking to us in the Bible is profound, but not complicated. In fact, you could boil all the Bible down to two words, law and gospel. Both are from God, so both are important, but they serve different functions. The law is God's first word to us. The gospel is God's last word to us. The law is God's word of demand The gospel is God's word of deliverance. The law tells us what we have to do. The gospel tells us what God has done. In AD 49, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the churches in the Roman province of Galatia. In AD 47, Paul, who was a staunch Jewish believer, was met by Christ and he uh, gave his life to Christ and then he was commissioned by God to go out and give the message to non-Jews, the Gentiles. So this was his first missionary journey. He went into the province of Galatia, stopped at Antioch, uh, started a church there, Derba, Iconium, and Lystra. Um, He told them, you cannot get to God, you can't have a relationship with God, you can't ever hope of going to heaven on your own efforts. You will fall short. We all do. And they received that message with joy. They were delighted. But then, after Paul left, people we call Judaizers came into Antioch and the other cities, and they said, no, commitment in Christ, faith in Christ, will not be enough to get you right with God. You also have to be circumcised and keep the Old Testament law. So Paul responds to this in the book of Galatians. And today we're in Galatians chapter 5. If you want to turn to it, there are Bibles under all the seats in front of you, or if you have your own. He tells them that the teaching of the false teachers represents a different outlook a different opinion, in fact, a different religion. He contrasts these two religions, the law and the gospel, in Galatians 5, 1 to 12. One is false and one is true. I'll start at verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Paul has, says that the gospel has set us free. It's not so much freedom from sin, but freedom from the law. The Christian freedom is freedom from the tyranny of the law, the dreadful struggle to keep the law in hopes of gaining favor with God. It is freedom of acceptance by God and access to God through Christ's death on the cross. This last spring, I had an appointment one day, and I had to leave the house, but I couldn't find my cell phone. Now, I always keep my cell phone in my front pocket, but it wasn't there. So I ran upstairs to see if I'd left it in my closet. 
it wasn't there. Then I rushed downstairs to my study to see if I'd maybe put it on my desk. It wasn't there. Then I hoofed it out to the car to see if I'd left it in the console. It wasn't there. I stormed back into the kitchen to see if I had left it there when I was eating breakfast. It wasn't there. Then I called to Jory and Cam and Jamie and Erica and said, have you seen my cell phone? It really wasn't a question. It was an accusation. Where did you put my cell phone? I was getting desperate. I had to go. And so I stormed upstairs one more time. And I reached in my coat pocket, which I'd been wearing the whole time, and it was in my right pocket. Now, how crazy is that? Yet, I suppose all of us do something like that. Frantically and frustratingly looking for something we already have. Paul says, don't look for acceptance with God through obedience to the law. You already have full acceptance with Christ. Paul then goes on to give them a command. Galatians 5.1, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burned again by a yoke of slavery. We must stand firm in our freedom and must not lapse into the idea that we have to somehow earn God's favor by doing more good deeds than bad deeds. The gospel sets us free from the law. We should not enter in again to a, a slavery to the law. The vast majority of the slaves in the South who were freed, legally freed, December 18, 1865, went on to live just like nothing had happened. They continued on as slaves in their slave owners' homes. Though free, the blacks live virtually unchanged lives throughout the, what we call the Reconstruction period. Shelby Foote, in his monumental three-volume work on the Civil War, verifies this surprising anomaly. He writes, The Negro was locked in a caste system of race etiquette as rigid as any had known in formal bondage. Every slave could repeat the with equal validity what an Alabama slave had said in 1865 when asked what he thought of the great emancipator whose proclamation went into effect that year. I don't know, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln, except they say he sought us free. And I don't know nothing about that neither. That's tragic. A war had been fought. A president had been assassinated. A new law had been signed into Constitution. Yet many slaves continued to live under their cruel taskmasters, their slave owners, until they died. You and I who have put our trust in Christ, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, have the same choice. We can live in freedom that now we are fully accepted by God because Jesus fully kept the law and then died for our sins. Or we can enter in again to slavery, to trying to prove to God by our goodness and how well we do that we've earned his favor. In verses 2 to 4, Paul comes to the precise issue the false teachers were teaching. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Uh, when we were in Michigan, we, we met with our three girls to go through these journals that we have. And when we got to this chapter about circumcisions, they all <laughs> giggle. Um, and uh, so here we are. We're supposed to giggle as we read about this. Um, the false teachers were saying that Christian converts had to be circumcised. You might think it's a trivial matter. I mean... Circumcision is a, a relatively minor surgical operation on the body. Why does Paul make such a fuss of it? Because of its theological implications. As the false teachers were pressing it, circumcision was more than a physical operation. It symbolized a different religion. Namely, salvation by obedience to the law. Luke tells us what they were teaching in Acts 15. Certain people came down from Judea, probably more likely Jerusalem in Judea, to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Then some of the believers, verse 5, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Thus they were declaring that faith in Christ was insufficient to reconcile us to God. Circumcision and obedience to the law must be added to it. That was tantamount to saying that what Jesus began, Moses has to finish. Paul tells the Galatians what they were committing themselves to in verse 3. Again, I declare to you, every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. He says, if you are circumcised, then you have to keep the whole law. Then that's your religion. That's how you get right with God. He warns them in three sentences what will be the results of receiving circumcision. Verses 2 and 4, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ and you have fallen away from grace. So, more simply, to add circumcision is to have Christ be of no value to you, to be alienated from Christ, you lose Christ, and you fall from grace. You cannot have it both ways. It's impossible to receive Christ, thereby acknowledging that you cannot save yourselves, yet at the same time be circumcised, saying that you can save yourselves. It's either one or the other. You cannot add circumcision or anything else for that matter to Christ as necessary for salvation because salvation is in Christ alone. The gospel sets us free from the law. In verses 5 to 6, Paul makes two statements about the gospel. For through the Spirit, he says the life in the gospel is to be lived by the Spirit. Before we knew Christ, we could not possibly earn God's favor. We couldn't live in obedience to the law. We didn't have the power. Even after we give our lives to Christ, we cannot obey the law unless we depend on the Holy Spirit. So it's the process of following Christ is very much a spirit-led operation. Our children seem to have all had problems cleaning their rooms. I go walk up to their room. Most of our bedrooms are in the top level. And I uh, say, uh, you probably need to clean your room. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get around to it. And No, I'm serious. I, you know, you got to clean. Hey, we're having some people over. Everybody's got to have their rooms clean. Ah, nobody's coming up here. You never know. Got to get your room clean. So I'd harangue them, I'd, I'd try all kinds of things. But they didn't ever really want to clean their rooms. Cleaning the room has to be something that comes from the inside where they feel like, you know what, I, gotta, I, I, I'm not, I can't live in this. I got I to gotta do, do this. It, it, so it comes from the inside. So on June 12th, we had a graduation party for Jamie, who, was gra who graduated from Lincoln High School, and for Erica, who graduated from Beverly Cleary School as an eighth grader. On Saturday, June 11th, Erica knocked on our door at 7.20 in the morning. She said, do you want to see my room? I said, oh, all I can see is the sleep in my eyes. You know, we were both, Jordan and I were both sleeping. So I went into her room, and it, it had just been like a tornado for months. And um, her bed was made. It was perfect. It looks like Jory had made it. There was nothing on her floor. All the clothes had been picked up, folded and put away, and all the papers from school that she'd let be strewn around, they were all gone. I said, where'd you put everything? Then I looked in her closet, and I said, oh, I see. <laughs> she'd, she'd hung a lot, but the stuff that was left over just kind of, you know, pushed it in there. Why did she do that? She wanted her teacher and her principal, who were coming to the party the next day, to see her where she lived. It came from inside. Second, he says the gospel is lived by faith. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. We wait by faith. What do we wait for? We wait for Christ coming again, where he will judge all people and take us to be with him in heaven. 
We wait for it by faith. We are not anxiously trying to secure it by our good deeds, by obedience to the law, but we're trusting in Christ's death on the cross. We wait for it. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision can improve our standing before God. All that matters in order to be accepted by God is to put your faith in Christ and His death on the cross. Faith in Christ does not mean that now since we're forgiven we can live any way we want. It's supposed to result in a better life, a life shown its, that shows itself in love. Now, in verses 7 to 12, Paul zeroes in on the false teaching, the false teachers. He traces the false teaching in three ways, its origin, its effect, and its end. Its origin, it's not from God. Verse 7, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. The false teachers had persuaded the Galatians to abandon the truth of the gospel, but this persuasion was not from God. God had called them in grace. A religion of law can make God seem mean and cruel and condemning, but God is not a God of condemnation. God is a God of forgiveness and restoring and grace. The false teachers were propagating a religion of merit. Its effect, it was spreading. Verse 9, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Just like you rub some yeast into a batch of dough. I know most people don't bake bread anymore, but it spreads throughout the dough. Well, the error of the false teachers was spreading. It started in Antioch and then up to Lystra and Iconium and Derba. All the churches were becoming contaminated with this. You've got to be circumcised and obey the law in addition to putting your faith in Christ. And so it was spreading. A couple was having some troubles, and they were putting each other through the silent treatment. Didn't talk to each other. It was just quiet in the house. So the husband needed something one night. He needed his wife to wake him up the next morning. He had an early flight. And apparently that was their marriage. She got up early and she would wake him up. But he didn't want to break the silent treatment, so he just put a note by her bed. Please make, wake me up at 5 a.m. Next morning he woke up at 8 a.m. He'd missed his flight. He's mad. He's upset. Why didn't she wake me up? He storms out of bed and he finds a note by his bed. It's 5 a.m. Wake up. <clears throat> the longer they held on to their anger and the silent treatment, the more it began to spread into other areas of their lives. So because of the cause and effect of the false teaching, because it was not from God and its influence was spreading, Paul was determined to resist it. Its end, the false teachers will pay a penalty. Verse 10, I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Paul is sure that the error will not triumph. And the false teachers will pay a penalty. God will deal with them. Verse 11, brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Paul's statement sounds coarse and malicious. We may be sure, however, that it was not due to an angry spirit or a spirit of revenge, but due to his deep love for the people of God and for the gospel of Christ. I venture to say that if we were as concerned for God's church and God's word as Paul was, we too would wish for false teachers to cease from the land. We live in an age of tolerance. People love to have the best of both worlds and hate to be forced to choose. It's often said that it doesn't matter what people believe as long as they are sincere. All beliefs turn out about the same in the end. 
But the gospel of Jesus Christ is vastly different. It will not allow us to sit on the fence. It urges us to choose, particularly between the gospel of Christ and the law. The law stands for religion of human achievement, of what we do by our own works. That represents just about all religions you know in the world. Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is different. It stands for a religion of divine achievement, of what God has done through Christ's death on the cross. The law means works, slavery to impossible human merit. The gospel means grace, freedom of being fully accepted by God. We must choose. The one impossibility is what the Galatians were attempting, namely to believe the gospel, faith in what Christ did, but add to it works of the law. No, the law and Christ are mutually exclusive. The gospel sets us free from the law. The primary message of the Bible then is this. The lawmaker became the law keeper and died for me, the lawbreaker. Is that up there? Say that with me. Let's read it together. The lawmaker became the law keeper and died for me, the lawbreaker. The overwhelming message of the Bible is not the work of the redeemed, but the work of the redeemer. What Jesus Christ did for us. Which means the Bible is not first a recipe book of Christian living, but a revelation of who Jesus is. Who is the answer to our unchristian living. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul making this very clear and very simple. We cannot hope to get right with you by doing our best, by trying to be good, trying to have more good deeds than bad deeds. We are all sinful. We fail every day. And we have to admit that we can't do it and ask for your grace and thank you for dying in our place and then put our faith in you. If you've never done that, I want to urge you to do that. Every head bowed. If you're not sure, you could commit your life to the gospel right today. You say, Jesus, there's no way I can be good enough to earn my way into acceptance with you. I believe that you died for me. Thank you. I put my faith in you. Forgive my sin. And if you do that, this is the day you have begun a walk with Jesus Christ. If you've already committed your life to Christ, you might need to say, you know what, I've slipped back into this whole merit deal. I'm, I'm trying to be a good person and do more good than bad and trying to earn your favor, God, and I see that's hopeless. Instead, I need to admit every day how far I fall short and ask you for forgiveness and then for your power of your Holy Spirit to change me from the inside out so that I want to be good. So help me not depend on myself from now on, but depend on your Holy Spirit much more, much more so. I'll give you all just a few seconds to pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us through your word, and uh, may we live in dependence on your Holy Spirit this week, and in thankfulness for you dying for us on the cross, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.